Greetings, everyone. Welcome. Um, my name is Seth Powell. I'm a PhD candidate at Harvard University, where I am currently working on South Asian religions, Sanskrit, and the history and philosophy of yoga. My dissertation at Harvard focuses on medieval and early modern yoga traditions, uh, particularly in South India. My dissertation is going to focus around a Sanskrit text known as the Shiva Yoga Pradipika, or the lamp on Shiva's yoga, uh, a text from South India from roughly the 15th century that brings together Shaivism, Bhakti, devotional traditions, and the physical techniques of Hatha Yoga. That is not what I'm going to be talking to you about today, um, but rather some other work that I've been doing that helps to flesh out the historical context of yoga in South India during this time period of the 15th and 16th century. So in particular, we're going to be looking today at visual and material evidence that I've been covering from temples, Hindu temples uh, in South India. So without further ado here, I'm going to jump into my presentation here and I'll try and share my screen. And there we go. So my talk today is entitled Visual and Material Evidence of Medieval Yoga and Yogis. And I'm just going to jump right in here. So so today, um, the critical study of yoga and its history is undergoing quite a resurgence right now uh, as university scholars around the world have been increasingly turning their attention towards uncovering um, this history in new light and new materials are coming out all of the time and our understanding of this history is increasing really every day right now. Much of this history, as we know it, is derived from the study of Sanskrit texts using the methods of philology. Um, most of these texts exist today in palm leaf manuscripts and uh, exist in archives in libraries in India and in other libraries around the world. And while these texts or yoga shastras, these scriptures or treatises of yoga, uh, provide us with an incredible window and often the only window onto yoga practice traditions in pre-modern or pre-colonial India, often these texts are prescriptive um, in that they give a kind of idealized view of what yoga should be. Often these texts tell us how the yogin or yogini should place their foot or where they should put their hand or if they do this posture or this practice, then this fruit or this siddhi or power will accrue. Uh, and in this sense, um, they're not sort of describing yoga on the ground as such, but in some ways giving a kind of idealized view of how yoga should, would, or, or could be. Um, and in this way, the texts give us a sort of incomplete view um, of yoga during that time. They give us the view of a particular author who was seeking to systematize or reconcile various yoga texts and traditions and to bridge those together in their particular vision of, of yoga. So what I'm trying to emphasize here is that while the texts will always be incredibly important and indeed often the only or primary uh, historical source of evidence that we have to reconstruct yoga during that time, it's difficult to equate what is going on in these texts in a kind of idealized sense with the yoga that was actually being practiced on the ground. So it's incredibly helpful to develop a more full or complete picture or view of the history of yoga to supplement these textual uh, materials with whatever other available evidence that we might have during that period. So in addition to the text, there's also uh, a number of non-textual types of materials that we might encounter to construct the history of yoga. In particular, what we're gonna look at today is some visual and material evidence. 
sculpture, painting, illustrated manuscripts, epigraphy, architecture, and particularly uh, temples or mattas, monastic institutions, all can provide an incredibly rich supplement or complement to the textual materials. This has been highlighted most poignantly um, in the recent exhibition on yoga, Yoga and the Art of Transformation, which was uh, curated by Deborah Diamond at the Smithsonian uh, Institute in 2013. Perhaps many of you uh, got to attend that exhibit or you've seen the publication that came out from it. Um, this is a beautiful example of how the visual and material evidence can give us a much richer and more complete um, vision of yoga's past, especially when read alongside the texts. So all of this is not to elevate the visual or material evidence above and beyond the texts, but rather is an exercise in reading them together to flesh out kind of a more complete, nuanced and detailed history of yoga. Okay, so the visual evidence, I also should say, it, unlike the prescriptive religious texts, the visual materials often give us a sort of artistic renditions of yogis in practice. So often the paintings or sculptures, the incredible detail that these artisans would have used to paint or to carve and sculpt these images suggest that these were artists who were actually encountering yogis and practice traditions um, in their very region. And not always, but sometimes to the best of their ability, were sort of giving a sort of descriptive uh, codification in stone or in painting um, of these yogis. So it can kind of give a sort of different angle from an artist's view than the religious texts that are promoting a sort of particular prescriptive and idealized vision of yoga practice from within one author's uh, point of view. So one example, a very famous example of visual and material evidence in the history of yoga is this very famous seventh century sculpted relief from off the coast of Chennai in Tamil Nadu at Mamalapuram. This is the famous descent of the Ganges relief. Here you see in the center of this incredible sculpted relief, the Ganges river descending down to earth from heaven. And if we zoom in into the upper left quadrant here, we see this ascetic performing tapas, cultivating spiritual heat. This is actually a king named Bhagiratha who is performing penance to the god Shiva, who has his hand bestowed, offering him a boon for his incredible penance. As scholars such as James Mallinson have recently shown, this early ascetical tapas tradition of cultivating bodily heat by standing on, let's say, one leg, ekapada stitta, or raising the arms above the head, Urdhva Bahu, uh, are early sort of proto forms of some of the later physical techniques of Hatha Yoga. Some of the later standing asanas, we can see early prototypes of those postures in these earlier um, ascetic and tapas traditions. So we have this beautiful sculpted relief here of this sort of tree-like posture, right? This ekapada sthita. And if we zoom out a little bit and we go down to this lower right quadrant down here, this is one of my favorite images. Perhaps some of you have seen this. We have a cat who's sort of emulating the Bhagiratha ascetic in the top left. And he's doing a standing tapas or penance as well. And he has his little mice or rat devotees who are giving pranams, prostrating before him. And we have, um, if we read this against some of the textual evidence in the Dharma Shastras, we see this trope of the fake guru or the fake yogin who is likened to a cat. And so it seems like the artists were playing on this trope of the false yogi or false ascetic here um, with the cat doing 
tapas and the maiz devotees. Again, if you look across the river over to the left side here, you can see an earlier moment in the Bhagiratha ascetic narrative where he's doing this sequence of tapas and asceticism. If you look at these seated figures who, unfortunately, their heads have fallen off and deteriorated over time, this is actually the one figure of the king, Bhagiratha, performing this sequence of tapas. And if you look at the far left image there, around his waist is this yoga belt or yoga strap known as the yoga patta in Sanskrit texts. And in fact, there's a long history of both visual material evidence and Sanskrit textual uh, evidence of this history of the yoga strap. Um, so in here, it's being used to sort of support the lower back and to fix the ascetic here in seated meditation in his posture for an exceedingly long period of time. Okay, so this is just one sort of quick example, and there's so much that could be read into this exquisite, one of the most incredible and iconic uh, sculpted reliefs uh, in Indian history, really, which you can go see yourself today uh, in Tamil Nadu. Um, but one example here of reading the visual material, this iconography, uh, and thinking about how it might suggest here in the seventh century of the common era, um, evidence, known evidence of yoga and ascetic practice that might have been common already at this time. Okay, so moving right along, that was just a little bit of context and background. Our agenda really here for today and with this presentation is to share with you some new and exciting evidence that I have documented uh, of asana practice sculpted onto the temples at Hampi in South India that we can date to the early 16th century, the early 1500s of the common era. So what we're gonna do today, in order to give a little bit of context for these asanas that I'm going to show you and to highlight their significance, within the larger history of yoga. I'm gonna begin this presentation by giving a super brief history of asana as we know it, based on some of the latest scholarship that's emerging. And then I'm going to share some of this field work and photographs from Hampi in the Southern state of Karnataka. I'll introduce the Vijayanagara empire within which these temples at Hampi are located and to provide some historical and religious context for these temples upon which these yogis are etched in stone. I'll then give an analysis of these sculpted images and we'll look carefully at some of these postures that seem to be depicted, noting uh, when possible some parallels in the visual material to the textual record and seeking to identify some of these yogic postures or asanas when possible. We'll then seek to identify the religious or sectarian identity of these yogis. And then we will conclude by sort of reflecting more broadly on the significance of this material and visual evidence um, particularly when it's read against the textual record. And we'll think about how this might influence our understanding of the development of physical or Hatha yoga traditions during the pre-modern period. Okay, so we've got a lot on our agenda today and um, let's just jump right in here. So first, a super brief history of asana. Okay, this is in no way a comprehensive history but I wanna give a little bit of context for the asanas that we're going to see sculpted in stone in the early 1500s and to highlight the significance of these asanas that I'm gonna show you, which are non-seated asanas. So as I'm going to show here, the majority of asanas in, that we have documented in, in 
yoga's earliest history are primarily seated asanas used for meditation. But over time, there is a gradual shift to non-seated asanas, and I'm going to discuss that here a little bit. 